Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast. So this evening, I am delighted to welcome Cam Joss. So welcome to the podcast, mate. Thank you, Rob. I'm very excited to be here. I've followed your show for years, and I've always thought you've done a wonderful job as as a host, and uh, you really get the best out of your guests that come on the podcast, and hopefully I can deliver something of quality. But uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Absolutely. No doubt about that. So I had the pleasure in speaking to you very briefly, introducing you for the Coaches versus COVID conference, which the guys at Hawking Dynamics and uh, Associates did a fantastic job in organizing. So just to preface this chat that we're having, if anyone does want to jump over there and watch that presentation, it's on free to, free to view on YouTube. I'd encourage everyone to, uh, to jump over there. But anyone that doesn't know who you are, Cam, been a few changes recently in your uh, work situation. Just want to give us a bit of an update on who you are, what you do, what you've previously done before, um, and a bit of background on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I've been, I spent most of my career in the private sector. So in 2013, I graduated uh, from my undergraduate, uh, with my undergraduate degree in kinesiology. And that's when I decided to try to make the choice between am I going to go work in the college university realm or you know, work my way up in some sort of team uh, context or am I going to go the private sector route? And so at that point, um, I had already been familiar with DeFranco's training systems and I had trained there as a high school athlete. And sometimes in the off seasons during college, when I was playing football in college, I, I went back and trained there as well. And I would, I would shadow Joe and just try to learn what he was doing. And I was fascinated by sports performance at that point, um, just because I had felt what he had done for me as an athlete and how I was able to physically develop. And so I studied it in school. And after that, uh, when I was done with my undergraduate degree, I was just trying to figure out where to, where to take my life. And Joe ended up offering me a job, like a low totem pole job in 2013 at DeFranco's Training Systems. And I was familiar with him at the time. And I had watched him work with high school, college and pro athletes. And it was just, it was a cool place to be. And he was a, you know, a big big name in the industry at the time. And I felt that it would help develop me in this career and what I wanted to do. And so I went to work with Joe and I wasn't sure how long I was going to work with him, but I ended up working with him for seven years. And so uh, I would say really within the last year, I started trying to think about where I wanted to go with my career. And I was learning a lot from the private sector and a lot from basically in the private sector, you know, you have, total control over what you're doing and you can give the athletes whatever you want with whatever equipment is available to you and spacing and things like that. So it was just one big lab experiment for me for seven years. And, uh, I made a ton of mistakes along the way. You know, I just, I really had to learn how to, how to program, how to be a coach and how to be a manager, how to relate to people as players and, and, uh, people as people. And so I just thought I want to take these lessons I'm learning in the private sector and see if I can, bring them to a team setting. And I, and I just missed being a part of a team setting because I played college football and I just, I love the the atmosphere of preparing one team for a common goal and just the game day atmosphere. You can't beat it, you know, and just being with a team for a full season, all the ups and downs. I just missed that side of it because in the private sector, you have, you have so many different athletes, but they play for all these different teams and all these different sports and you try to make some games and it's hard to make every game. And, you know, the, the reward is seeing them play the sport for me. So, um, but I wanted to learn also how to interact with a, with a full staff, you know, other, other members that are constantly interacting with me on a daily basis, as well as sports coaches and how to work in conjunction with them and how to find ways to check your ego with everybody around you. And so all of these challenges fascinated me and I was given the opportunity, um, in March to come to Indiana University, I was I, I got a call from from Aaron Wallman, who was formerly the head strength coach at the New York Giants in the NFL, and I got to know Aaron because I was in East Rutherford um, the entire time he was there with the Giants. So he got the job in 2016, and so I was working out at DeFranco's in East Rutherford there at the time, and uh, I met Aaron at a at a small seminar, and we got in touch, and we continued to meet up and communicate. And we were, I mean, 99, if not 100 percent on the same page with so many things, you know, it was just 
let's meet together and talk about what we're doing. And I would, I'd be like, here, I'm doing this. And he'd be like, wow, I'm doing that. Or like, <laughs> you know, he'd say, I'm, I'm doing this. And I'd say, I, I'm doing that as well. You know, so it was very organic from the beginning. And I, I always said to myself, if I ever had an opportunity to work with him, I was going to just hop, hop on it. You know, I, I was even willing to just take time away from what I was doing at DeFranco's to try to go intern for him for free, just to be around him and learn, learn more from him at the New York Giants. And so when he called me, it was just one of those things where I knew that, you know, for a while I had wanted to be with him and I respected him so much. And so I hopped on the opportunity and, and here I am. I'm at Indiana University now and we're, we're working with the football team. So Aaron is our, is our um, you know, main director. He's, he's got a very long title that's a mouthful, <laughs> like senior assistant athletic director for football performance or something like that. I'm just athletic performance coach. But basically, he's the head guy. We're working under him. He brought in an, an amazing staff of guys with Justin Collette and Peter Remus and Chris Allen. And we're going to try to do the best we can. We're, I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. So as a, as a player, were you any good in college football? <laughs> Could have been <laughs> significant. If I, if I knew what I what I know now back then about preparation, I would have been a lot better. But, um, yeah, it's funny because I talk about how uh, – when I, when I work with athletes now and try, especially from a psychological standpoint, trying to instill some confidence in them and try to get them not to, to, to not shy away from confrontation and high anxiety moments and pressure and just embracing that side of sport. And I, cause I was, I talk about my experience and I admit to them, I say, listen, I, I went to college just feeling pretty good coming out of high school. Cause everybody's good in high school. That's like the joke they say, you know, then you get to college and it's, it's, it's for real, you know. It's you're not playing against just some some random teenage kid anymore. You're playing against a bunch of grown men. And so, when I got to college, I'd shut down psychologically. You know, I just I couldn't handle all of it. I just I stayed on the team and I tried my best, but I think I got progressively worse over the over the four years I was there at sport. You know, because I just I, I the level of athlete I was seeing, I didn't see it as a challenge. I saw it as intimidation. And so I just I did the bare minimum that I that I could to get by. And I, you know, I was, I was a weight room guy. I was, that's what I say. I, 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 I'll, I'll have all the confidence in the world in the weight room, but as soon as it came to being an athlete and moving on the field, and that's where I felt inferior to others. So instead of trying to work on my weaknesses and, and, you know, continue to develop my strengths at the same time, I just only focused on my strengths. And I think that really affected me in my athletic career. And, um, I joke that I'll be 30 at the end of this year and I'm significantly more athletic now than I was at, at 21, you know, cause I've just finally embraced the fact that like, who cares what, what people think and judgmental wise, like I'm just out here trying to get better. If I, if I fail at something, that's an opportunity to learn. And so I'm just, I'm trying to bring that to my athletes. I did that in the private sector and I want to do it here. You know, I just tell them, listen, embrace failure, just accept it. Just go out there and try, you know, just give it your all coaches might yell at you, but who cares? Like just say, okay, what did I do wrong? And let me fix it. And let me come back and do it better. So long story short, I was not that good. <laughs> <laughs> so with them learnings in college and how you dealt with it in terms of being the weight room guy, is that influenced where you focused your learnings and your time and your, I suppose, develop, sharpen the, sharpen the, the sword um, as a, as a performance coach? Yeah, I would say so yeah. because when I was training at DeFranco's when I was in high school, you know, you take a high school kid and we, we, we all seem to know this in the sports performance field, but if you've done nothing and you just start lifting weights, you're, you're going to get better at pretty much everything. You'll get faster, more powerful, and you'll just feel so much better. You're just, you have access to a, a body you didn't have before. Um, and, and, you know, Joe, what we had at the time was just a weight room. Like we didn't have any field space. And it, it, th those were the old videos where we're pushing prowlers in the parking lot, you know, like getting stuck into a, a hole in the asphalt or something, you know? <laughs> so that was, that's when I was there, you know, when I was in high school, that's what we were doing. And so the, as far as like movement field type of work, the furthest we got was that parking lot and pushing sleds and dragging sleds. So, um, but still, because I was so raw, it helped me develop. But then I stayed married to that as an athlete. So when I got to college, I said, uh, I was, I was of the mindset as a naive young athlete who knew nothing that, if I just could squat 50 more pounds, I'll be a better athlete, you know? And um, when I think back on that and how false that is and how I neglected my, I shied away from the field work. I shied away from improving my ability to, to be fast and move efficiently and move in uh, multiple directions. And, you know, it's just, I, I didn't embrace that side of it. So, yeah, I mean, 
it's funny how people seem to know me more as sort of a speed field training type of coach because I was not that type of an athlete. And I know mm-hmm. the, detri- the detriment of ignoring all of that work just mm-hmm. firsthand. Yeah, amazing. Um, so we're going to, I suppose, focus this chat around max speed. And that's, like I said at the start, based on um, your presentation with the Coaches versus COVID. And I think you've done a couple of presentations since. But to kick us off, for the simpletons like myself, benefits of max speed training for team sport athletes and then we'll use that as a as a bit of a jumping off point to um to get into some discussion from there yeah i think there's there's certainly a number of bullet points associated with with that answer in my opinion and i think bar none i will never argue this that team sport is is acceleration dominant in nature that the the your, your bread and butter is going to be your ability to accelerate. Um, but just through the research I've done and talking with researchers like Ken Clark, who does a lot of research on top speed and many of the track and field coaches I've talked with as well is just, do you have, in my whole approach to training is I want to leave no stone left unturned as best I can. So what are some of the benefits we're seeing with maximum speed? Well, One is just, it's going to affect your entire speed curve. Because if you have the ability to, uh, you know, hold and and operate at very high speeds, then you're going to be faster at every segment below that as well. I mean, it's just, they go hand in hand. Like the, you have to not just be able to accelerate to get there, but you have to be able to operate there as well. And so when I see an athlete that struggles in a high velocity setting, they don't know how to operate at very high speeds. They can, once they start approaching that environment and it's a very unique environment and i think that's that's something that is of value to mention but once they get into that high speed environment they struggle because they don't know how to cope with the dynamics associated with it so i think that there's um the, the biggest game breaking plays you'll see in team sport are going to involve these explosive long distance runs for the most part that are just the ones like that, that people go mad over are going to be, you know, these very fast athletic the, in, in American football, the guy who, who runs for 60 yards and nobody's able to catch him and he scores a touchdown, you know, or in rugby and they just break a big run and they score a try or something, you know, that's a lot of these things are, are in speed environments, but the, even though they're very rare, it doesn't mean we should, should, we should neglect them. And when I think about a high speed environment, I think of something that is so neurologically unique that there's no other way to really operate and train that until you're in that environment specifically. So it's, I do believe it's true. We can't do much in a weight room setting or outside of achieving top speed to help the athlete develop in that environment. And there, it's a very elastic environment. So it's just, does the athlete have the ability to operate in an environment of tremendous elasticity? Because at the beginning, you can argue is it's going to be a little bit more muscularly driven when you're accelerating. There's going to be more just pure force, power, muscular effort that's that's being invoked. But if you're operating effectively at top speed, it's it's mostly through elastic actions and elastic recoil. And that's where a lot of team sport athletes, in my experience, start to struggle is that they don't know how to operate effectively in that elastic environment. They don't have that elastic ability because all we're doing is training with heavy weights or we're just doing jumps and we're only doing 10 yard sprints or 10 meter sprints or sled sprints and things like that. We're not getting them into that elastic environment. And so if they have that ability, I think it's going to protect their bodies as well. I think it's going to protect their structures. It's going to allow them to understand from a motor coordination standpoint, how to activate and utilize various forms of connective tissue, not just the muscle. So I think there's a lot of different benefits to it. Um, not the least of which is that they'll just, they can get faster. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned then about the, the splits and we'll, we'll come on to this in a bit more detail because I think this is a really interesting um, area to, to chat with you. But in terms of them splits, why are you, why, why, I suppose, why are you focusing so much on that? What does it, what does it tell you and what kind of testing are you doing to understand that a little bit better yeah so i assume you're talking about whether we're taking like 10 yard segments or exactly exactly yeah, yeah. sorry so yeah. yeah if we're if we're looking at different segments to me it paints a picture it gives you a story and i believe that every 10 yard segment or 10 meter segment um 
is going to give you a different story. And I think if you want to be even more precise, you could break it down to five meter or five yard segments. But um, just looking at a 40 yard sprint time, if we see, we see the end result, we know what that is. We know how, how, how they covered 40 yards and what time, but we don't always see the story of how they got there. And I think that these 10 yard, there's, there's certainly deeper forms of analysis as well, but as a simplistic one, I think the, the split times can give you a, can, can paint a picture because you look at the first 10 yards and what are some of the qualities associated with overcoming your own inertia from a, from a dead stop, from a static position that's going to be primarily relative strength and relative force ability, you know? And so I, I think of it as the first 10 is going to be where you're going to see a lot of uh, high force orientation occurring. And if they are struggling in that first 10, there's a good chance that they're struggling, not just with high force in general, but also orienting that high force horizontally into the sprinting direction. And if we look at from the 10 to 20, it's probably uh, we're going to see a lot of the pure explosive power type of qualities coming to light there. And there's a reason, in my opinion, that we see very strong, very powerful athletes run well for the first 10 to 20 yards and keep up with even the fast guys because they're very strong, very powerful. But there's a reason why they fall off after 20 yards. And for me, I think it's because the dynamics and the biomechanics and just all of the uh, kinetics associated with it and kinematics are that that is where they are entering into pretty much just velocity at that point, pretty much just very high speeds past 20 yards, especially in team sports. You know, Ken Clark uh, had the paper with that he studied um, NFL combine athletes from, from one of the years. And I think it was the 2016 NFL combine and just to a man, everybody was around 95%, you know, at, at their, their max speed by 20 yards. And obviously the ones who were faster and had better, velocity capability were at a lower percentage of their max speed because they could continue to spread it further. But some of the people that were, were really slow, probably your linemen and your bigger guys who are only strength, they're, they're even closer to 100% of their max speed by the time they're at that 20 yard mark. So I think after that is where it's just a speed environment. And that's where what I talked about before, that elastic ability comes into play. And um, the further you go from there, the more, the only way you're going to improve that segment. So for example, the 30 to 40 yard segment for me, I think the only way you improve that segment is sprinting at high speeds at that point. I don't think there's going to be much of anything else that's going to help translate or transfer or develop that other than just exposing yourself to that high speed environment and understanding how to, how to operate there for that final 10 yards. So one one little graphic that you had, well, really good, good graphic you had on your presentation was associated exercises with them particular segments and I, I know that would be probably one that there's all the the screenshots to put on social media because it's a it's a really interesting slide and something that people can i suppose actionable would you better describe that describe that for us sure yeah so i mean based on what i just said if we if we look at like the first 10 it's never going to be uh, it, it might be somewhat better correlated to max strength but if you look at just force time data and the kinetics and the kinematics associated it's just it's already like your first step is already so much more explosive than anything you can do in the weight room but i see it as more of uh if we take the two terms of strength speed and speed strength so when i think strength speed i think power where strength is more of an influence like the the force times velocity equation the force is going to be more of a contributor to that versus the velocity whereas i think speed strength is going to be more Velocity is a more important factor there. But if we look at the first 10, in my opinion, that's that's where I, I just kind of call that segment like a strength speed segment. So if we're doing things like, you know, if you're if you have good relative strength, if you're if you're training well in the weight room and, and you have good relative strength and you can perform well in things like Olympic lifts or you perform well, you know, those are vertical plane activities that will talk about your your force capability in general, or at least in a vertical plane, if you want to get specific to it. But then if you're also able to operate well with things like a heavy medicine ball throw for distance, so now we're thinking more of a horizontal type of an action. Um, and then if we get a little bit more specific to sprinting, if you operate well with a heavy resisted run or a heavy resisted sled push, and you're able to cover ground in fast times, you know, just applying that force effectively into the ground in the horizontal direction, you're very strong there, you're probably gonna have a good 10 yard sprint. If you're good at all of those things that are higher force dominance um, in terms of training for power related activities. 
And then I think if you look at the 10 to the 20, for me, that's where it becomes a little bit more based on your speed strength. So how well do you operate in things like multiple jumps? You know, like if you can do a, a triple broad jump, how, if you're one of the people that is dominating that, you, you're probably going to be somebody who's just naturally very powerful and you have some longer coupling reactive ability. And what I mean by that is you're, you're able to continue to produce power over large ranges of motion. So, um, you know, with your hip, knee and ankle being associated in there. So longer coupling, just longer ranges of motion and a power activity. You could take a lighter medicine ball throw and, and really, you know, chuck the hell out of it. You can, you're, you're really powerful from that standpoint. You're, you're probably gonna be somebody that's good, uh, in, things like hill sprints, you're going to dominate hill sprints, you're going to dominate light resistance sprints. You know, when there's a little bit of a tug, you're, you're, you're really good in that situation because you have a lot of speed strength. You have a lot of power uh, against some uh, lighter loaded activities. And then after that, that's where, you know, some of these more generalized activities start to fizzle out in my opinion, because once you go beyond 20 yards, some of the things that are going to develop those, those segments, I think you have to start making it more, specific to what's happening on the field. So I do think you'll find some benefit to doing, you know, plyometric activities will probably help, it, you know, up to the, the 30 yard mark or the 30, 30 meter mark. And just what I've seen things like long bounds, or um, if you see from, from Altus, they do the dribble run uh, variations and components associated with that. So just running A's, things like that, where now you're just, you're teaching your body to uh, be in that, upright sprinting position and, and still be elastic. And right at this point, I see that as the 20 to 30 is more of your reactive elastic ability shining. And, and if you're good with reactive elastic activities, so shorter coupling activities. So now we're not going over as many ranges of motion, but we're still effective with our force application, that truly elastic, truly plyometric activity. If you're somebody that's good at that, you're, you're probably going to be good as well up to the 30 yard mark. But beyond that, I think, like I said before, the 30 to 40 yard mark. Now that's truly just your max speed ability. You know, how, how well do you operate in a sprint at 95 plus percent of your maximum velocity capability? And I think if you're, if you don't operate well in that environment, you're not going to be a good finisher in the 40 yard dash for the last 30 to 40 yards. But if you're somebody who's very good across all these different spectrums, you will be able to spread your acceleration out over the entire race and you will get faster at every 10 yard segment and I uh, think you'll be a pretty good performer. So for me, it's about trying to, especially with our skilled players that are faster positions, how do we develop them at each of these segments and understand where they're, where they're limited? You know, how do we do that? And that's, that's the challenge every day. Do you think as this is a massive generalization, it's something I've, I've discussed with, with Stu McMillan and a few other guys. Do you think we're most comfortable as athletic performance coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, whatever that, whatever you want to term yourself, most comfortable in how you've described it there at the naught to 20 piece and then suit we get a little bit more uncomfortable as we move beyond that and try to develop them kind of qualities in in our athletes absolutely i think that the traditional upbringing for all of us in sports performance is we all read about the weight room first right so the field was like what is that like i need to learn <laughs> about that later you know so yeah. Um, I think there's a reason why triphasic training was such a hit because it was, first of all, amazing book, perfectly written and just what a contribution to the field. Mm -hmm. But people loved it because Cal gave you all these creative solutions to do in the weight room, right? So uh, I think the weight room speaks more to most of us in the field. And I think that what we need to realize is that everything is just training. It all exists along a continuum and everything is part of a layer by layer approach and sure it's complex, but if we start trying to dissect all these different layers and understand them, it's like, I think of something like a, like a deceleration work on the field. And I know you've had Lauren Lando on the show as well. And mm. this, is where, this is where he and I really agree is if you're working a deceleration on the field, it's the same logic as you would work eccentric strength in the weight room. It's now just being applied at higher speeds with, less load because it's just your body weight and it's in a specific force vector but it's the same logic it's still we're training eccentric development or eccentric utilization so i think if we can start thinking of it from that standpoint more we won't freak out as much and i think that it will not make the field intensive work seem as intimidating and we will be able to just say hey we, we went through the period of understanding how to 
teach our athletes to squat, bench press, deadlift, Olympic lift. Oh, we, we went through the period to understand the techniques. I mean, we, we hammered it. We, we went to all the different seminars. We, we wanted to know everything we could about this. Um, why not apply the same logic to what's happening on the field and how we do these things in safe positions? And I, I think it's, they shy away from it because they're afraid of pulling hamstrings and, or pulling a hip flexor or, or a quad or something like that. And I totally get it. You know, I've, it, like I said, I've made many mistakes in my coaching career. And early on when I started, after I read everything by Charlie Francis, you know, you read one Charlie Francis book and you're a track and field genius. <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I, I just said, I just need to, great. I have my athlete sprint. They'll be faster than everybody. And I found the secret sauce, you know? And so I remember having, uh, years ago, having an athlete try a flying sprint for the first time and he just massively pulled his quad, you know, just, and then the next time I had a, I, I took another guy and he, he did it and he just, he just tweaked his hand, like sniped, you know, the sniper shot him right in the mm -hmm. hamstring. And um, I'm not afraid to say it because I made these mistakes early on. And that's when I realized it's not just giving them the drill. It's like you need to, and I think a lot of coaches had similar experiences and that's why they've, they freaked out about it, but I knew it was important. I knew we needed to do this work because they're going to sprint in the game. They're going to sprint for long distances at times. And especially in, you think about American football, you have a kickoff. They, they sprint straight down the field and chase the ball. So how do we improve these positions? How do we learn about them? So that's why I took it upon myself to just reach out to people like Stu McMillan, reach out to people like Lauren Landau, all these people that were, doing these things for years and had all these experiences and I just needed to learn it. And so for me, I realized that as I was able to learn more about it, it became less intimidating. And I started learning how to slowly introduce these things to our athletes and what are the underlying qualities that keep them safe and the positions that keep them safe. And that was the real premise of that presentation at the coaches versus COVID event. And also, you know, I wrote an article for Simply Faster that went along with that as well. And it's just the reason for that was because I was just seeing how these athletes didn't know how to operate at top speed and nobody was really helping them understand that. And so I just wanted to put it out there and say, here's what I found from the people I've talked to. And here's some of the ways I've gone about trying to help it. And I know that here's three examples of athletes that uh used to have hamstring problems and then they started to mitigate them once they were able to improve some of these activities and these actions. That's reminding me actually, cause I need to start Cal again, cause I'd love to get him on. I spoke to Ben early days, but I'd love to speak to him. Uh, be interesting. Um, yeah. So the next point, and it was kind of a nice little segue based on a few things you just said there and look at the notes of 20 been the, potentially the most comfortable area for athletic development coaches because of the, the background, like you said. But the do you think there's a potential overemphasis on the drilling of this kind of thing is what we're, we're talking about? So obviously a lot of influence, increasing influence because of the great work done by Stu and, and Dan at Altis. But people are going heavy on that <clears throat> and seeing the drilling as the, as you termed the secret sauce, and going going over um, over the top with that with it with the team spot athletes. Do you think that's a potentially a, a pitfall that many coaches fall into? Yes, hundred percent. And I think that it again goes back to, and I've been guilty of this myself. So I'm not talking smack about anybody in particular. If anything, I'm God. talking smack about myself. Yeah. But I, what I've been guilty of is I've learned a sprint technique. And it's like this eureka moment for me. And all of a sudden, again, I feel like I have the secret sauce. So now I'm just going to go out and look at everybody else's athletes and say, oh, he sprints like shit, you know, or he's, <laughs> he, he, he doesn't look good at all. And like, if, if they were in my program, I'd be able to work with that. Like I've, I've been that guy before. And that's admittedly, you know, when I was a younger coach and I didn't understand, uh, <laughs> I didn't have the wherewithal to understand that I can't coach everybody's athletes and who the hell am I to say that I know it all anyway. And as, as if it's my information, it's all stuff I yeah. borrowed from, from all these other amazing coaches, right? Like none of it is mine. And um, so, yeah, I think that the problem is a lot of coaches certainly just want to be heard, you know, and that's because we, we like to, we like to, we are passionate about what we do. So I think that we like to feel like we have some influence over our players, but I think some I talk with Lauren Landau about all the time is know your role, you know, just know your role, know what you're doing. You're, you're, uh, what I learned from Fergus Connolly is that we are facilitators. We're not dictators. You know, we 
We facilitate performance. We basically give them hints and provide them with environments um, that they can then utilize and develop themselves to be to realize their own potential. So we're not here to just hold their hand. So let me let me say this. I made this mistake, and this is a great case example that I just remembered, and it's worth bringing up. Is I had an athlete one year training for his NFL pro day, and I was not going to be a able to attend his pro day. So he was training with me and he was going to go to a different state to do his pro day. I handheld him through the entire process of training. I mean, I over drilled him. I over cued him. I was constantly just like, if he made one small little error, I had to fix it immediately on the spot right then and there. Right. And I was focusing on very specific positions. I mean, I was getting down to like, your knee angle should be this, your shin angle should be that. Like I was, I was that guy for that year. And, um, cause I was reading all these books and learning about angles and what's efficient and what's not needless to say, he went to do his pro day. I was not there to hold his hand through it. And he completely shot the bet. You know, it was just, he, he didn't run well at all. He, it's, he needed me to tell him what to do at every single segment. Like, where am I putting my hands when I'm in my starting position? Where am I putting my foot? What do I do when I take off? Like I was, I'd be the guy like yelling at a mid sprint, like, you know, do this with your arms, do this with, you know, just whatever it was. And, um, but it, I, I just, he got back to me. He's like, I, I performed terribly, you know? And that was where I was like, it hit me that I had just, I didn't give him ownership in his own development. I didn't facilitate him. I dictated him. So, um, I think that we need to understand what to cue and why. And I think that's where my conversations with Stu are great because Stu will, we had this conversation yesterday, I believe, where we look at what are the stable components of movement. And Lauren Land is all about this as well. You know, what we call those the attractors of movement versus the fluctuations. The attractors are going to be the stable components. So that's those are things like you need to know to accelerate. You have to be able to manipulate your center of mass in a certain way. So how do we get them to understand how to how to maintain a positive shin angle? As they're going into like, these are positions that we're looking at and maybe it's not even a cue maybe it's just we give them a little bit of resistance they feel it they automatically get into that position and then their body learns this is how i accelerate properly but if we talk about change of direction it's you know we, we lower our center of mass to become more stable like that's an attractor that's just a general movement principle so we can coach that hey you're you're really tall when you're going into your cut maybe try to try to sink into it a little bit more you know sink your center of mass will be more stable you'll feel better you know maybe Think about how to manipulate where your foot plant is going to be outside of your center of mass, you know, in order to feel the ground appropriately to get the kind of push off that you're looking for. And the same thing occurs with sprinting. You know, it's just you're either accelerating in a straight line or you're when you're changing direction, you're really just you're decelerating, you're moving yourself about the earth and then you're just accelerating in a different position. So, yeah, to me, I just see it as what are we looking for? What are the focal points? And I love how at, at Altus they talk about these motoric cues and things like getting them to instead of like a position or something, it's just hey, pop off the ground or things that allow them to understand an experience, you know, or pretend the ground's on fire or something like you know, just things that they, that they just kind of intuitively understand rather than you know you need to be at this knee angle and this hip angle and foot angle and dorsiflex your toe, you know, just whatever. So um, yeah, I think that. The challenge is understanding what's worth queuing. And also, you go you go into Charlie Francis stuff, he talks about this as well, where it's just the idiosyncrasies associated with each athlete. That's why I love that that picture that Stu put, the silhouettes of all of the sprinters starting and how you see the same attractors I talked about before. You have this, this awesome positive line of force application from the foot through the top of the head on the, on the foot that's being planted into the ground. And then with the knee that's being driven forward on the swing leg, you have this positive shin angle for all of them, right? It's the same general principles that we're seeing, but the specific hip extension pattern, the specific knee angle, the specific arm angle, the body lean is slightly different based on that individual. And I think that's where we, we let things go. I think we need to just allow them to explore their own fluctuations their own technique based on many layers. Again, it's not just how they're built because that's, that's a huge component. Their anthropometry, the way that they're structured will dictate what kind of shape they can get into, but their force velocity characteristics as they exist right now. And if an athlete gets stronger 
we might not even have to say anything. And all of a sudden they find a different sprint position because now they're just utilizing something. We've opened up a new uh, degree of freedom for them. Or now they understand what a stable ankle position feels like because we've developed that with resisted sprinting and plyometrics or something. You know, it's just so we don't have to say anything about certain things. They're just going to start to learn it as we peel away these physical constraints associated with the athlete. And so I think that's where we need to just learn where do we cue, where do we not, what do we cue and what don't we cue, what's really an issue and what's just that's just how that particular athlete moves. And for me, it just comes down to, is it dangerous and is it unsafe? And if it's not, if it's just kind of awkward and, but they're still achieving a quote unquote efficient position and maybe it could be a little bit better. I'm going to allow them to just explore that over time. And that brings me nicely onto the next point, which is another one. I'm pretty reflecting all these kind of questions on my own um, misgivings, I suppose. And that's looking at technical models from track athletes and going, oh, fantastic. I've got something that I can, I've got a number or I've got a picture that I can go on. It needs to look like that. And then we, 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 and that's why our team sport athletes I'm, I'm, t- I'm talking about there. So we go sprinter, he looks like that. Our team athlete, team sport athlete, he's got to look like that. Is that something that, again, as a generalization, we are pretty falling to the trap of, of, of trying to put that on our, the track athlete on our team sport athlete in terms of technique? Yeah. I think if we, if we beat a dead horse with it, yes. And I mm-hmm. think, but I do think that um, I am of the opinion that if we are going to borrow from a certain discipline, we should try to understand the efficient principles of that discipline. So what I mean by that is if we're going to squat an athlete, let us try to search through the healthiest and strongest power lifters. And I say healthiest because some of the strongest ones are not healthy yeah. uh, and, and try to figure out what are, if we can find that balance between healthy and strong, what are they doing right? What are, the, what are some of the principles we see of what they're doing? How are they loading their structures? And let's borrow that. And then if we're going to squat the athlete with a power lift, let's do that. If, if we're talking about Olympic weightlifting, Sure, our athletes are not going to be the greatest Olympic weightlifters in the world, but if we want to utilize one of those activities, we should we should look to Olympic weightlifting to understand the general principles of how to do it in an efficient manner um, where they can perform at a high level and be efficient with that activity. So I think sprinting is the same where um, it's all context related, right? So if we're talking about doing a linear sprint, it's why are we doing a linear sprint? It's it's not to necessarily to develop game oriented speed, you know, because game speed is incredibly complex of all the things that are associated with it. If you you know you, you get into the perceptual cognitive elements and all these different factors, which are probably beyond the scope of this podcast, <laughs> but um, game speed is incredibly complex. But why are we doing linear sprinting? Is because we want to develop the athlete's system to produce very high speeds. And so if we're going to uh, train the athlete's central nervous system and system to just develop speeds at a very high level and do so in a safe and efficient manner. Uh, maybe they, you know, maybe they aren't going to ever hit their actual top speed in the game. And they're probably definitely not going to, um, as opposed to, you know, if they're in full pads in a football game versus, you know, shorts and in a workout, but we're doing it to overload the velocity side of things. We want to improve and push that athlete's speed ceiling a little bit higher. So, um, in my opinion, that's that's where we do look to track and field just for that specific context. So it's not that it's a cure all. And I think it, it, I know for a fact Stu would agree with this. And some of these track minded people, Dan Paff would agree with it as well. And um, it, it's not that we think if somebody just runs the fastest linear sprint possible, they'll be a great team sport player. I mean, that's absurd. And I think we can all agree that that's absurd because otherwise we'd go and get a soft Powell and Usain Bolt to come play American football. Um, so but the context of what we're trying to develop is that linear speed. So for me, it's that's where I say, if we're utilizing this activity, let's just try to make sure they're doing it as effect, effectively and efficiently as possible. So they're being able to stay very safe and then their speeds are continuing to climb. And we're just developing this raw motor output quality. And that's all it is. Um, so now, again, we're giving this athlete a degree of freedom associated with their uh, motor toolbox, if you will. And now they feel a little more confident from a speed standpoint. So maybe when they go into a game speed environment situation, when they see somebody coming to tackle them out of the corner of their eye, they think I can outrun this guy now. 
instead of I need to stop and try to cut around him. You know, maybe they thought that before, but now we've opened up a toolbox for them in terms of we've given them more speed. So now they're going to proceed that and say, no, I can outrun this guy. I feel confident in my speed ability. So for me, that's where I see the context of it all. So at that, from that standpoint, I do think it's important to understand what are the best sprinters doing to be the fastest in that context of linear sprinting. So when we're drilling linear sprinting, we borrow from that. But we are perfectly aware that that is not going to just magically give me these amazing athletes on in American football on game day. You know, So that's the way I see it. Mm-hmm. Just come back to that because Usain Bolt did try his hand in football in soccer over in Australia. I'm um, not quite sure how well that, how well that went. It's, it's, yeah, even before this, it, it wasn't happening. So I think that's been binned. Um, yeah. But team sport athlete, common faults. That was one thing that I thought was really interesting from your presentation. Would you, I think there was three that you, you mentioned, but feel free to elaborate and, and, and go further if there's, if there's any more. But them three were, were particularly interested. There was, there was case studies and pictures and videos presented. If you could um, just identify them and, and, and go through that, that would be absolutely fantastic. Sure. Yeah. I mean, really, the biggest issue I see is just what I call the butt kicking epidemic, if you will. And that was that was kind of the title of the article I wrote for Simply Faster. And um, I just got tired of watching these athletes in this position where they were overarched, where they had excessive anterior pelvic tilt. And just to picture what that looks like is basically your chest is pointed straight ahead, but your hips are pointed towards the ground. So you're in this like duck butt over arched position where your hips are pointing towards the ground. You're just in this like very weird curved position in your spine where you're so overextended. Uh, and at that point, you're basically locking your hips into this position where they can't really move through any more of a range of motion. So the leg is just going to sweep behind the body. So if you were to look at an athlete from the side and just draw a line straight down from his head to the ground, you know, how far behind that line is that leg swinging? And the further back behind that line, the more you're just experiencing this this butt kicking phenomenon. And the reason I call it this butt kicking phenomenon is because the heel will literally come back behind the body and then slam into the butt before it comes forward again. So it's just this slam And then it comes forward. And I saw it countless amount of times in team sport athletes. And certainly a lot of times it'll be influenced by the game itself. So if you look at soccer, you know, just because of handling the ball, if you have the ball in in your possession, you're you're not going to run with a lot of these front side lift mechanics that we're looking for. Obviously, you need to keep your feet lower to the ground because you have to control the ball. You know, so there's just aspects of the game that, that people get into, like, well, they're not going to move like that in the game. And I was like, well, but if we're looking again, just at the context of sprinting around on the field uh, without the ball, that's where I was just seeing a lot of these team sport athletes just totally butt kicking out the back. And I think where it comes from is I have to imagine at some point it's just something that's ingrained because we, we, add, we added the human illusion of a finish line. So they're just like chasing this line, you know, instead of like, I, 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 I have to imagine if we're seeing like cavemen and Neanderthals running around a the field, they would actually be very efficient with it because they're not, they're just looking for what they need to chase and go after. They're not chasing a particular finish line. And I think that that causes athletes to sort of lean for that line and over arch towards it. Um, but basically what it is, is they, they come out in this low position and they keep their body leaned forward. And then they just lift their head and their chest. So it's like their hips are basically still telling them to accelerate, but they're beyond an acceleration area in terms of how uh, it's globally applied to their entire body because they're working against gravity as every step uh, accumulates. So we, we know Altus calls it projection rhythm and rise. So every step you're projecting forward um, optimally, and that's going to be more horizontally oriented when you're coming out with a lower lean. But eventually that turns into vertical force application that, allows you to float across the ground. And then we have uh, rhythm. So your your the rhythm of your stride is going to start to pick up gradually as you get faster and faster. And then you have this rise factor. So your center of mass is going to naturally rise as well with every step until you reach top speed, at which point it'll be it'll be maintained in a position. So I think what's happening is is that projection and rise 
factor is where they're missing the boat. So as their rhythm is increasing, what they're doing in this butt kicking position is they're actually applying braking forces to their system. So their heel striking out in front of their center of mass. So they're landing on their heel instead of landing more on the midfoot to project themselves forward in a more effective way. When they're landing on their heel, they're basically doing the equivalent of you go to your Globo gym and you get on the hamstring curl machine and you load it with like 500 pounds and you just do 50 reps of that. Because if you think of every step you take, I think a 40 yard dash is you know somewhere over 20 steps or something like that. But it's, it's like every one of those steps is a rep, right? And then you factor in the fact that you, you can have up to, you know, five times force, five times your body weight of force being put into the ground as, as speeds increase. So uh, to me, it's just no wonder when athletes are running in this way where they're just landing on their heels, they're butt kicking out the back. They're applying these excessive braking forces to their muscles. So they're actually telling their lower limb to decelerate. So then the hamstring is just using the muscle to curl itself forward to continue to pull itself across the ground. You're asking the hamstring to operate for something it's just, it's, it can't really handle. And so you're not taking advantage of your tendons or your other connective tissues, your fascia that are going to help propel you in an elastic environment. And you're making it almost purely muscular uh, more so than you would if you were efficient. And I think that's where the hamstring starts taking on in other structures as well, perhaps your hip, your groin, your quad, it's, it's starting to take on more load than that particular muscle can handle at that moment in time, because you're, you're running in this unsafe position. And if you're, especially if your coach is saying run faster and faster and faster, you're going to continue to put more and more intent into each step. And it's just, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's why I just, I wanted to address that issue from what I was seeing, because all my athletes that had these hamstring problems were all running that way, you know, and it's, it's not, if you look at efficient sprinting from efficient sprinters, they look totally different. And so I knew they weren't hitting some of these attractor landmarks that we're looking for. That was my next point to ask you, uh, apart from lack of efficiency and potentially slower times, what other issues did this, does this butt kicker bring? But you've, you've ticked that off. So You've answered that question already. But the next one, the forward leaner. Oh, sorry, mate. I've still got you. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, mate. The next one, the forward leaner. What issues does the forward leaner bring? So in my experience, like I, I called it the forward leaner because this was a kid who, who seemed to understand what I was – trying to get him to do from a principled standpoint, but he was just, again, he was just chasing that, that line. He was just leaning too far forward. So he, he did understand the, the principles, but then um, because he was leaning too far forward, his hips were just staying pointed towards the ground. Um, so the classic butt kick issue, which was like the, the first example I showed in that presentation in the article I, I have for simply faster, he's just got every problem you can imagine. He's, he's, <laughs> He's, he's overarched, he's forward leaning too much, right? So the forward leaner is an example of somebody who's not necessarily, they're not overarching. Uh, they're actually pretty neutral in their spinal arrangement and, and like the way that their hips are arranged and things like that. It's just that they feel the need to be leaning towards the finish line a little bit more. Um, so they're just, they're, they, they don't trust themselves in that elastic environment, I think intuitively. They feel more comfortable using their muscular force than elastic recoil. And I think that's why they're just leaning forward because they feel more comfortable trying to just utilize their muscles. So um, that still leads to all the same problems where you're still gonna get excessive swing out the back. It's not gonna be as bad as perhaps somebody who's really overarching, but it's still gonna be there and there's still gonna be some hamstring issues that occur, at least from what I've seen in my experience. Nice. And the last one was the overarcher. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the overarcher is like he's upright the way you want him to be, but he's just overarching through through his spine. So his, his chest is puffed up, his rib cage is sticking out, and because he's he's upright the way you want, and maybe he's getting good uh, good effective force into the ground in terms of through the ankle. Like uh, the example I gave in that article, that that client of mine from DeFranco's was was very elastic in nature. He actually was very good elastically. He had a, a very good high velocity capability. But he was just in this weird position where he just felt the need to just arch. I mean, he's just he was sticking his rib cage out. He was puffing his chest up really tall. So even though he was upright um, and putting good force into the ground, it was just that his hips were pointed low. So he was reducing his available range of motion 
And so when we talk about front side lift, we talk about the thigh being punched a little bit more towards the belt line. So if, if I was just wearing a belt on my hip, my thigh would come close to where that location is. It doesn't have to be perfectly that high, but it's just, it's going to approach that area more so than if I was butt kicking and my leg was not going to swing as, as high in the front if I was butt kicking too far out the back. So with that front side lift, what we get is basically you'll, you'll find that the foot is going to be further off the ground in that position before it starts to swing back towards the ground. So if the foot has more space, space gives you more time. And if you have more time, then that means you have more time to produce force. So if we can give our body more time to produce force, we can generate more force. So now if you look at some of the stuff from Ken Clark, more efficient sprinters are able to apply greater force into the first half of ground contact because they have that better front side lift and because they have, they're taking advantage of that, that greater space differential. So when I have more time, I can produce more force, which means I apply more force in the first half of ground contact, which gives me a much more powerful ground reaction force when I'm applying force into the ground. So that's why with that, I can propel across the ground much more powerfully than if I was butt kicking. So, because if you look at an image of what that looks like, like if you look in, in my, the article I have for Simply Faster, you'll find that, that the, when the foot swings forward, it's barely off the ground at all. So it gives me no time to really produce any force from the ground. And, and plus I'm landing on my heel rather than having the time to swing it back through and land on my, my midfoot to then propel myself with utilizing multiple forms of connective tissue, not just solely uh, predominantly my muscle taking the brunt of the load. So with the overarcher concept, that was the main issue there was not that he was not able to have these elastic qualities and he, it's not that he was, uh, not upright in, in, in general, but it was just because the hips were tilted down because he was in this overarched position. Uh, he was, he was preventing himself from having the time to produce that efficient force into the ground and that greater force into the ground. And so because he was, his hips were in that position, he also wasn't getting, he was still landing more on his heel than on his midfoot as well. So he was still somebody who was experiencing some hamstring problems um, just because of his hips were not in more of a neutral posture that would be conducive to safety. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, and, and there's obviously a, a point of diminishing returns here where like I talk about how you want front side lift to have more time, but if I were to lift my knee up towards my friggin' scapula, you know, like that's just, it's, that's, there's a rhythmic side to it. That's why we said projection rhythm and rise. So we talk about some of the, the rhythmic components to sprinting. So there has to be a trade-off at some point, but where, where is that point that's optimal for that athlete where they have enough front side lift where they can apply effective force from the ground and do so in a way that's safe and efficient for their bodies. Um, and they have high performance at the same time. So that's what we're always looking for. And so um, it's going to be a little bit different for each athlete. I think if you have somebody who has very long limbs, they might appear as though they are butt kicking. And it's important because they might not be. And so that's where you have to look at uh, perhaps a video of them running or something like that. Because to the naked eye, it will look like they are, but perhaps it's just because their shin bone is so long. Like you look at Usain Bolt and it looks like he's butt kicking a lot if you were to just take it literally and far too literally because his heel is getting really close to his butt. But it's not It's not about the heel getting close to the butt. That's the problem. It's where in relation to that, that center line is the heel getting close to the butt. If it's far behind that center line, then that's an issue. But if it's as the, the, the legs are coming together and actually on ground contact, the thighs are, are pretty pretty much in the same plane and, and, and together, then that's probably a safe position. And it just looks like it's somewhat of a butt kicking position because it's a long shin. So it's, it's where's his leg going to go? You know, where's the shin going to go? It's just it's got to come back forward and he's just got a long shin. And sometimes it just it looks one way. But when you start to dissect it and look at it um, in terms of the landmarks that really matter, that's when you start to see what's actually inefficient or what's probably not an issue. In terms of fixing these issues, is there any commonalities across fixing the three that you've mentioned that people can maybe, I know it's generalizing and um, maybe not going to the depth that is pre-required for these kind of things, but is there any general um, methods of, of correcting these three? Yeah, I think, 
for it's well there's general individual methods that i've <laughs> that, that that i've come across so what i mean by that is um more often than not you're going to have athletes that are going to respond to you communicating what they should do with the limb in space so sometimes you take somebody and you say hey punch, punch that thigh up a little closer to your belt line and they figure it out and it's done you know it's just now they're in a better position that's very rare uh just to be honest in my experience, that's not enough for them to, they, cause they've just done it one way for so long for you to just say that and be like, okay, I get it now. It's, it's very rare. And that's the other thing too, is no matter what cue you're using, you can't expect an instantaneous improvement. It's more about just communicating them to communicating with them and allowing them to understand the concept and then they can work towards it slowly over time. Um, but it's either the limb in space that allows them to comprehend what's going on, or it's going to be the force application into the ground. And a lot of the better athletes I've worked with, it's going to be the force application into the ground that you communicate. So again, using some of these, the concept of motoric terms, like that's what Altus would call them, and just getting the athlete to understand a concept or a premise. At top speed, I like to use the cue pop, you know, pop off the ground because, um, I don't think anybody can comprehend the possibility of a slow pop, right? Everybody understands a, a pop is quick and it's explosive, right? It's just like, whoa, you know, it's, it's a pop. Um, so your, your ground contact should be a pop at top speed. It's like you're popping off the ground. It's very quick. It's pop, 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 pop. So that's one cue that I use. Another one is I say, just imagine that the ground is getting gradually hotter with every step you're taking. Like it's just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. You're just running over these flames. Right. So every step you're taking, it's like running over hot coals. So, you know, you need to get across the hot coals, but you can't spend a lot of time on the ground. So figure that out. And so that's that's one that actually worked. That one did work instantly with that particular client that I had, who was the overarching type of profile of this butt kicking issue. And um, when I explained that concept to him, he just he just thought about that, about I'm running over hot coals and his body self regulated itself to get into a, a more efficient, more efficient position. And that was the only time I've seen that happen where it happened, like just right away, every other time it's just been a work in progress. Um, sometimes I'll say things like pretend or, or, or picture that you're running up a set of stairs that's gradually, gradually leading up into the horizon, not the sky. I used to say the sky and I took that away because then they were leaning far too back. And then it just, it looked like they were, you know, leading a marching band with a baton. <laughs> and so I said, you know, just pretend like you're, you're running up a set of stairs that leads right to the horizon. And so I've never seen anybody go upstairs with, with crazy excessive backside mechanics, you know, unless it's somebody trying to tone their glutes on the stairmaster at the, at the Globo gym or something, you know, just something that's not humanly natural. Um, so the stair concept, like if you were to run up a set of bleachers, I mean, you'd have great front side lift the whole time because it's just, you have to just to get to the next step. Well, that's, that's kind of what sprinting should look like. So it's especially at top speed. So um, that's another cue that I've used as well. And then in terms of just uh, a drill slash cue that worked together was the, I just call it like the med ball knee punch run. So I give an athlete a med ball, usually anywhere from four to six pounds, maybe eight at the most. Um, and I actually like a six pound is, is around where I like it to be. Cause I think that's light enough where it's not totally deteriorating their sprint form for the worse, but at the same time, it's somewhat heavy enough where they feel the tactile feedback from it. And I have them hold it in front of their body right around the level of where their, their navel is or their belly button. And then I just tell them run and then just try to see if you can contact your quad to that medicine ball as you're running. And a lot of times what the athletes will say is they're like, I feel like I'm just doing running high knees. And I'm like, well, watch sprinting in slow motion. And that's kind of what it looks like. And there's a reason why the Altus dribble progression, it's just basically this cyclical high knee type of activity. And if you look at it in slow motion, it looks very similar to top speed sprinting. And that's why they've seen some effective um, uses of doing things like that. But if we take this medicine ball and we say, Hey, I want you to just run, you don't have to go full, full speed, but just run and start getting used to what that feels like to achieve that type of front side lift. Um, and now they have a goal where they're trying to aim to hit their leg to that medicine ball. It doesn't have to actually contact the ball. 
I just want to see if they can get it close to there. And this drill doesn't work for every athlete, but it's worked for um, certainly a handful of athletes that I've had. And all of a sudden, usually when they get into that position, what they will feel is a weakness in the ankle, you know, because they've never trained their ankle to handle that much elastic force or, or, or recoil. So they start feeling wobbly at the ankle when it comes down from that type of a height. And that's obviously another issue that you need to address later. It's just because the ankle complex. And that's why you hear all these sprint coaches talking about how a strong ankle is important to transmit the force from the hip into the ground. But that's a way for them to, to kind of comprehend that is getting them in a position like that. So that's, that's another drill that I've used. And it's kind of a mix of a drill and a cue together. But I like the word pop more so than I used to use the word punch because that was something I heard from Ken Clark. But when I would use punch, I like punch more for acceleration work. Uh, cause when I would use punch at top speed, they were, I mean, they were punching the living daylights out of the ground. And I was like, you guys are going to just explode your, your, your shin bone, your kneecaps going to pop right out of your, your skin, you know? So, um, they were punching it far too hard. It was far too aggressive. It wasn't that graceful, elastic, smooth ground contact that we want. That's still powerful, but smooth and, and finesse almost. So I started using pop instead. And that seemed to be better. Whereas an acceleration, if you use punch, Acceleration is a little bit more violent to start off, whereas I see top speed is a lot more graceful and uh, fluid. So those are just some of the cues that I've used uh, from a general standpoint. And that's helped pretty much 80% of what I've seen. And then you're going to have 20% where you need to come up with something else to help the people that just don't get it. But um, those are some general ones that I've used. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I know we've got a couple of points left, but I'm, I'm conscious – that I want to keep almost keep something up our sleeve because I'm I'd love to do a part two and there's like we could go all night I, I definitely know we could go all night Cam so there's yeah the last two points I'm gonna I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you if you'd kindly come on for a part two in the future because it'd be great to cover them but anyone that wants to dive deep I know you mentioned the Simply Faster article so a we'll link to that obviously the co- uh, COVID versus coaches presentation as well social media. I know there's a little bit of start, a bit of a story behind that, but we won't go into that now. In terms of getting to get into um, getting into contact with you on social media, where's the best place? Yeah, so I'll, the only social media I have right now is Twitter, and I, I just made it. I mean, a matter of days ago, I think it was last week. Um, so that is at IU for IU stands for Indiana University. So it's at IU Coach Joss, um, and that's my that's the Twitter handle that I'm using right now. So that's one way to sort of follow what we're doing at Indiana football. It's not just me. I'm a part of a staff, an amazing staff. And it's just uh, we all want to contribute and, and just show what we're doing as a, as a staff of five people committed to sports performance excellence, as dramatic as that sounds. But that's <laughs> kind of how it is. And, um, yeah, in terms of uh, products and things, I have articles I've written on Simply Faster on multiple topics. Some of them uh, are a lot older at this point And. Maybe I need to review them myself and look at them, but there's articles I've written for Simply Faster and I will continue to write for them. I have a book series I've uh, started writing with Dr. Fergus Connolly called The Process, um, and that is available on Amazon. So, if, or, or I should say level one and level two are available on Amazon. We're still writing level three and level four because we just, we had so much information. We, we just wanted to spread it out over a couple different books. Um, and yeah, I mean, those are, those are really the areas where where people can follow what I'm doing and, uh, you know, just see what we're doing at Indiana university. So that's, that's, that's about it at this point. Awesome. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's good enough for me. Happy days. So if any questions direct them to Twitter, that's the best place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I have, a the, the email I work at, that I have at work is, um, it's just cjoss at iu.edu. So that's just my the Indiana work email. So if there's, any coaches of it want to want to collaborate or talk about uh, sports performance topics? You know that's that's one place to do it as well. So, um, but yeah, you know that's just following things that we're doing. It'll be it'll be on Twitter and things. So, yeah, awesome, perfect. Push people towards Twitter if they want to get a bit more in depth. Email's the way to go. Well, thank you, Cam. Really appreciate it. And like I say, I'll be stalking you again for a part two because I'd love to cover them them with the topics as well. But yeah, thank you very much for giving it me time. Appreciate what you do, and uh, we'll chat soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, and I'll absolutely be here for a part two if you want to do it. (laughs) Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. Speak soon. Thanks. Take care.